Um, you know, I was on that victory stand for moments, but I lived it getting there. And I was proud of that life of what it took for me to get there. I was every single day. I was, I don't think I was ever happier than when I was training really hard and it's just a purpose filled life. And you know, that you're doing the absolute limit that if you, if I did another stroke, it was going to hurt me more than it was going to help me. I guess, you know, kind of with that experience and your dad kind of being like, you're going to give up a full ride and go to California and train for a year and a half. Um, you know, talk to me about the experience going to the Olympics and, you know, what that meant for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I, I had been told since I was seven years old, like you're going to be in the Olympics. And, um, I was getting telegrams from friends that I used to swim with back when I was seven, eight, nine years old. And they're like, we always wondered why you were an A swimmer and we were B swimmers. And now we know. <laughs> and, uh, um, but, um, you know, it, it really was much more I me. Mean, I like the name of your podcast because it really was the journey much more than the being there. Um, you know, I was on that victory stand for moments, but I lived it getting there. And I was proud of that life of what it took for me to get there. I was every single day. I was, I don't think I was ever happier than when I was training really hard and it's just a purpose filled life. And you know, that you're doing the absolute limit that if you, if I did another stroke, it was going to hurt me more than it was going to help me that, um, there was no question, um, you know, in my work today as a lawyer, you just, you don't get that same sense of like, I couldn't have done another thing, you know, because you always think, oh, I could have gotten one more phone call in, or I could have gotten one more thing. Um, um, I was, yeah, I was just really proud of the life that I was living. And it's a, it's a reminder that so much of the purpose of our life is something that we create as opposed to, because really what I was doing was looking at a black line in the bottom of the pool yep. quite a lot. Right? <laughs> but, but I made it mean that I was like living this noble life that I was proud of. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of lawyering, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of life is like that, you know, like when, when you have a newborn baby and you're, you know, carrying it back and forth. And it's like the purpose that you put into that rather than like, oh God, spit up again. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes yeah. for sure I mean well, and I love the the positivity that you've had through all of that and and finding ways to cope and get through those experiences um and then taking that into the pool with you um like you said just using yeah. that to make you better in the pool and um I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. You know, so many people would be like, poor me, or, you know, go into that dark place rather than allowing themselves to come out of that stronger and better for it. Right. So let me say a word about that because I don't want to leave anybody with some impression that like I'm this incredibly positive person because um, there were lots and lots of times that I just had to take my bad mood with me to practice. And I depended on my teammates and my coach. My coach always provided a certain kind of energy that I could kind of feed off of. Um, my teammates, absolutely, you know, in those hard times. But uh, without it, like, like one of the questions that people, kids in particular, ask me all the time is like, "Didn't you ever want to quit?" I was like, "Well, duh, <laughs> of course I did." <laughs> Who didn't, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. At some point. Exactly. <laughs> Right, right. And but what I say is like, I just took my bad mood with me to practice. Right. And I didn't try to make it wrong that I like that I was in a bad mood. Right. I didn't try to pretend that. Right. But 
um, like it's okay to be in a bad mood and swim mm -hmm. as hard as you possibly can in practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, there are times that I don't want to be a parent, <laughs> right? <laughs> there, are there are times that, you know, I don't want to be a lawyer and do what I'm doing. There are absolutely times, right? But you just kind of, you know, you, that's why community is so important in mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're doing is um, so that you can rely on those other people in those other times. For sure. I can rely on my husband or, you know, sometimes you're just relying on your own commitment. You know, I really want to be a great parent and I really want to have a phenomenal family. And so this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, swimming teaches us a lot of things, um, you know, and kind of with your situation and how you've kind of handled it. And um, honestly, I think you can tell a lot of, you know, just athletes in general that, you can go through these tough times and have the community, have the family, have the support, and you can get through it. Um, and I think that's something that's a huge highlight of, you know, who you are as a person and you should preach what you, you know, you've done. I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And um, I, I, I really do think it is something that you have to keep, you know, voicing um, to this community and, and, and as right now, I feel like in this, you know, where we are, you know, and I feel like everybody's voices matters. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it is more prevalent, kind of what Jennifer was saying, like, you know, Title IX is becoming more and more, you know, noticeable. I mean, and I think it's a great thing. And I think as a female, you know, and as a male, it doesn't matter. I feel like either gender, like this could happen to you. And so um, making sure that everybody is taken care of in the right way. And, you know, the people that have done the wrong, you know, they have to, you know, suffer the consequences of that and know what is, what is right and wrong and, and that it's not okay. And um, so I think that's absolutely great. And I kind of want to segue into kind of the next thing I want to kind of talk about is, your foundation and, you know, what you've kind of made of that. And so talk to me about your foundations and, and the other, you know, things that you've done for women as well, just kind of in, in this era and everything. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I, I run a nonprofit called champion women and we provide legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. And we have three major projects going on. Um, one has to do with we have every single school and how it is that they're complying with Title IX. We're seeing right now at the NCAA and how that the NCAA is treating women like second-class citizens. And that same kind of thing happens at schools. And so we, we take data from the Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act and we let every single school in the country know how it is that they're dealing with numbers of opportunities, scholarship dollars, and how they're treating men and women the same way. Um, um, unfortunately, the NCAA took away a, a um, the NCAA used to require schools be getting closer to gender equity in order to be a member of the NCAA. When Mark Emmer came on board in 2010, he took that away. And what that means is that who can assert a claim for sex discrimination are 18 to 22 year olds. And I just think that's unreasonable to ask them to do it without a community. And that's what we've been finding in all these cases where we're getting uh, schools to, um, to when we're getting, um, when, when a school, particularly when a school drops a team, mm -hmm. we kind of mm -hmm. find out who's upset about it. We contact them. We get a big Zoom with, you know, it can be up to 150 of those little squares like you're seeing here. <laughs> and we walk them through Title IX and, uh, and show them, you know, here's how you, but, you know, they need to have the parents and the boosters and the alumni, right? So that you have this community that's doing it. So it's not just there's just no way an 18 to 22 year old is going to call me and say, you know, I want to bring a legal action against my school. It's just not, I mean, right. That like, you need to like the, the parents, you know, right. Have, and the alumni who, you know, they know the president and they know the, the board of directors and the boosters and the everything else, right. It takes kind of all these different um, 
things going on at the same time to be able to um, to make sure that after they leave these cases, right? We're talking University of Iowa, and Michigan State, and William and Mary, and and Dartmouth, and mm -hmm. all these places. That's all been us, right? We're Fresno State, uh, San Diego State University, et cetera. All these places, we're we're the one who's getting these all started, um, and it's all about creating that community so it is safe for people to be able to do it. Uh, okay, so that's. Project number one, that was, I took too long to tell you that. <laughs> no, that's good. No, that's so, good, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we, we've uh, done a lot with the issue of sexual abuse in the Olympic movement. So for me, swimming was really a healing process, um, but a lot of pedophiles will use sport as a way to get access to kids. Um, most parents think that uh, the, that their club sport has the same protections that are going on at schools. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. So at schools, mm -hmm. right there, you've got an athletic director and a title line coordinator and a general counsel position. And right, you've got like, they're sort of a coach is part of a whole matrix, okay? Mm -hmm. A club sport, the coach is oftentimes head of the like there's there's nobody else to tell no them board, what to do. There's what no mean. nothing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Especially okay. depending on right. what level of club you're in, part of, and yeah, yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. there's nothing but the coach. <laughs> yep. Right. Exactly. Right. And and mm -hmm. there's no accreditation for that coach. So that coach could have walked out of prison the day before, and then, well, I should say that could have happened prior to the start of safe sports. So I got involved in this around 2010. And I, honest to God, I was so dumb. I really thought that, uh, you know, I, I, I had been doing this so much with sexual violence in schools. I thought, well, I can just apply that skill set over here to the Olympic movement. And surely if Scott Blackman, if the Olympic committee knew just how bad it was that they would do something about it. And um, boy, was I ever wrong. They, um, you know, they, they retaliated against me enormously. And I just kind of kept going. Um, I was with the Women's Sports Foundation for 30 years and they gave me a contract and it said that I was prohibited from talking about sexual abuse in any context. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wait, 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 wait. That, that's wow. my job, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So imagine like losing that community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard. It was really hard, but I started Champion Women yeah. and, um, and we just kept right on going. And then frankly, um, you know, one of those, it's, you know, it's a tragedy and it was lucky at the same time, Larry Nassar happened. And suddenly you had 300 athletes who are, I mean, those gymnasts are uniquely gifted at presentation and at, at, um, at speaking out and at rallying around each other and supporting each other. Um, and it was because of them that we were able to get two federal statutes passed that, uh, that sort of reworks the Olympic movement. So you all are now mandatory reporters. Mm -hmm. So you have to report both to police, as you probably know, and you have to, right? So that all, that's all, that's all us, what we wow. that's yeah, awesome. did. And yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm going to tell you, that was one thing. We, we had a huge meeting um, at TCU, and our athletic director uh, approached us, or our Title IX investigator approached us and said that if anything comes forth that you know as a coach, you are a mandatory reporter. No ifs, ands, or buts. You have to report it to our athletic um, you know, Title IX officer and you know, the Title IX office here at TCU, and yeah. you know, and it has to be inclusive. Like I can't tell anybody else. And so I thought that was something that was like, wow, you know, we're actually taking the right steps in the right directions of, you know, supporting these, you know, individuals. And it doesn't even have to yeah, be yeah, yeah. So, so, let, let, so let me ask you, yeah, in, in my day, coaches, quote unquote, dated their athletes. How much does that still happen? Here? No. That any, is, any place, any place I in, mean, the, in the swimming sports world. I, I'm not just swimming, but I can't really say like, um, in the sense of college, I haven't really seen it much in the college, you know, realm, but I would say more in the club level. I don't know if you know the old, um, Utah head coach who was a club coach. Oh then, yeah. What was his then, name? Right. Yeah. And so it, I do feel like there is still some of that, which 
you know, and that's where yeah, safety yeah. sport I mean, has there was been a huge job. That swimming, yeah, swimming could easily do in all sports, not just swimming, but mm -hmm. is just to lay down those bright line prohibitions that teachers know, lawyers know, right, doctors yeah. know, prison guards mm -hmm. know, right? We have special statutes that deal with people who run public housing. We have special, like whenever there's a power differential, but just think if if all these sports in their, you know, swimming world, swim, swam, you know, took out ads that said coaches shall not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athletes they coach, regardless of age or consent. Yep. And then and then let that be known to the seven-year-old, right? So the seven-year-old knows what that boundary is. So the seven-year-old, mm -hmm. you can't, a coach can't tell them like, you're not like the other girls and I've never felt this way before. And I think I love you and right. And you know how easy it is to groom a kid, um, mm -hmm. you know, 13, 14, right. 15, 16 year old. And uh, it's illegal conduct. But my, my Olympic coach in 1984 was Mitch Ivey. And Mitch is now banned by the U.S. Center for Safe Sport because he was molesting my teammate at the time. And I knew it was wrong, but I didn't, I wasn't, I was dumb. And I didn't understand um, that, number one, it, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. And the whole world knew that he was dating her. He was molesting her. But right, everybody knew that they were in a quote unquote relation. It's not real. I mean, like, right, the way we language is it, yeah, normalizes it, right? Yeah, and, right. yeah. so, um, so I, I honestly, I think if if we just taught that bright line to every athlete and every coach that they knew that coaches can't pick their romantic partner from within the athletes that, that they coach, when the US Center for Safe Sport, like we asked for their data. And by far and away, the danger for kids are men who coach and they, they molest young athletes and they molest older athletes, but it is typically men on women. And that is the Mac daddy problem. That is like 67% of all the issues with the United States Center for Safe Sport are male coaches on largely female, some boys too, for sure but largely females. If we, if you could, they could just address that problem. But like when you take the safe sport training, you just don't really get that. No, and that's, you know? and that's a thing, not to speak <clears throat> poorly about safe sport or anything like that, but I think it could be done better, if that makes sense. Instead of just clicking that's through, right you know, right yeah. yeah. Instead of clicking through and like, you should have a mandatory, you know, at meeting as, as you know, head coach has to have it with, you know, the USA swimming reps or, you know, within, you know, that kind of stuff. And then it trickles down into your assistant coaches. And I mean, I will say our head coach, I mean, he has head coaching responsibilities. So what I do um, is a direct reflect on him. And, um, you know, if I do something bad, he gets in trouble as well. And so it's kind of a trickle effect of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I would never want to put his, you know, line of job in jeopardy either of, you know, my stupidity or, you know, my foul actions or whatever the case is. But I agree with you. I think safe sport, sport should be done in a better fashion in a way. Um, than probably what it is right now. Um, because I, I don't think it's the stop. It hasn't really stopped, you know, those sexual predators or whatever the case is. Right, right. You, you're, you're not gonna, I mean, right. So sexual deviants who want children or who want to harm athletes, like they, they wanna use their power, they're gonna do it, right? Mm -hmm. the, the issue is how do we, how do we train the sports community so that they can spot them quicker and how that they can stop it before it happens and, and give the, the athletes the ability to say no, right? Mm -hmm. So that the athlete knows that coach is not supposed to be alone with me. The athlete knows they're not supposed to be calling me individually. They're supposed to include my parents or um, the other teammates. Um, they're, um, you know, they're not, you know, throwing things. They're not supposed to make me work out on an injury. Um, right. All the, like the, they, ha if a, if an athlete doesn't have the ability to say no, the way that the gymnast did not in at the Coroli ranch, then you're really setting them up for a very dangerous situation. 
for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think um, safe sports is a good, it's a good place to start, but we've got to continue educating parents and athletes themselves. Um, like you said, Nancy, at a young age, at seven, I mean, they can understand good touch, bad touch. and Oh, oh no, 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 no. By the boundaries. time you get to good touch, bad touch, when it comes to molesting kids, you've, you've lost them. You're, you've, yeah, you, you have to do it long before good touch, bad touch, right? You have to get them to like, oh, they're alone with me. Oh, they're trying to, you right. know, to text me individually. Oh, they're trying to, um, you know, like if you, you know, we, we go through this whole training of um, how is it that that coaches can groom kids? And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's remarkably similar for the kids, right? Like you're special is usually how it starts. I've never felt this way, you know, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? It, and to, so that, and to, but you can train somebody like, here's what to look for. Right, um, right. right. Yeah, but I guess- You gotta get them way before good touch, bad touch. I'm sorry to interrupt there, but- No, no, no. That no. That's, yeah. yes. <laughs> and I yeah. certainly agree with that 100%. I mean, as a school counselor, that's, it's right. essential, yes that you're talking about those things. So yeah. I have a question with that kind of going off of that. So you kind of talking about wanting to educate at a younger or, you know, building this community, right? Um, what are, are you in the lines of doing something in the sense of trying to make that happen or, um, you know, helping the lines of this? Because it's very important, right? that, you know, we want to educate our young, young kiddos and we want to educate our coaches and, and our families and our community of what is right and wrong in the sense of looking out for the signs of this type of instances. And so have you found a way or have you found something that you think could help um, make safe sport better and or, you know, other programs and, and whatnot? Yeah, we have, if you go onto our website, championwomen.org, we have um, a one pager that we wrote with an organization called Child USA that goes through a lot of simple things that parents can do. Um, um, you know, kind of, you know, the, the boundaries that we need to give children. I mean, there is a whole philosophy of parenting that children are obedient and compliant. And if you have that parenting philosophy, your child is much more likely to be abused because they, they don't, they're not allowed to say no, right? Mm -hmm. So you, it's, it's, it's more than just, um, but, but, you know, so it's getting our one pager is one. And then, I mean, seriously, we don't have time in this thing for us to talk about all the things that we've done to make sure that Safe Sports is adopting the right rules, because mm -hmm. as soon as the coaches associations get a hold of safe sport policies, I mean, I'm not going to get into all the details of how they want to change, how they, they want to, they want a system that when they get accused of sexual assault, that the system works for them. So mm -hmm. I'll just give you one example is <clears throat> if a coach doesn't want, you can stop me, but if a, if a, um, so as soon as a coach gets accused, then safe sport does an investigation and that investigation can take up to a year. And they really ask a lot of victims. So victims have to give, you know, their journals over and they have to give their therapist record and they have to give, uh, you know, other, other people who witness things and right. And so they give all this and okay, they do this whole investigation. If a coach doesn't want to, they don't need to participate in that. Okay, so then Safe Sport comes out with a with a decision. They say, yes, it happened, and you're banned for life. Then a coach can, the, the process that they've decided, remember, they don't have to have this process. Uh, then the coach can say, I want to have an arbitration hearing. And at that arbitration hearing, they can say what the say they can bring up new defenses that were never brought up in any earlier investigation. I mean, really it's, it. so my, my husband's an appellate court judge. An appellate court judge, you can only bring up things that were contested mm -hmm. in the trial court below on appeal. Safe Sport very easily could say in, in the hearing, you can only bring up defenses that were brought up below so that we have weeks and weeks and weeks to be able to figure out, you know, if, if you, 
you know, right, right, whether or not something holds water or not, right? But so can you see like how like it's it's a way that the process can really favor um, the accused, the mm -hmm. respondent. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, we, we, we just can't allow that. I mean, if you look at like who's on the board of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, it's all defense types. It's all people who work for organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs or, um, you know, organizations as opposed to plaintiffs type people who represent victims like me, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they, they don't have people like me on their board. Um, so, so consequently, the policies that you get tend to have to do with limiting legal liability instead of actually making it safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's just another area I think that we have to keep progressing in. I mean, we've talked about a lot of areas today that yes, yeah. we've right. made some progress in, right. but there's a lot of progress that still needs to be made for sure. But there's, there's really no area of sport that sexism doesn't uh, impact. Right, and that's what Champion right. Women does. Is every area where there where uh, there's sexism in sport is that's us, right? Mm -hmm. We address all of those in a in a legal way, where we we provide legal advocacy for girls and women in sports, right? So other organizations give funds for kids in need right. to be able to participate in. Right, we don't do any of that, right? But we um, we try to come up with what are what are ways that um, we can we can change fundamental systems so that um, uh, girls and women can have more opportunities and they're equal opportunities? Sounds like more support in, in a community, right? Uh, for right. That kind of stuff. So I think yes. that's awesome. And if anybody here wants to donate to us, we need yes. always need resources. <laughs> so go on to championwomen.org, and it's all one word, champion women and um, you know, Janine and I like to eat, so <laughs> you know, we, we uh, um, yeah, we're, we, uh, we really depend on those donations to be us to be able to make a difference. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I guess um, any advice kind of just in our closing kind of arguments or anything like that, any advice to any females or any females in sports or just in general, um, you know, advice that you want people to know more? Hmm. Well, I've already given a lot here. Um, um, I think the more empathetic that we are with each other, that the better off that we're all going to be. Um, if you want to uh, do something about the sex discrimination that's going on in your athletic department, contact us because mm -hmm. we know how to do it. We know how to create that community that it makes it safe for athletes to be able to do it. Um, um, you say else? that, and I was really shocked with the NCAA basketball tournament situation and how those girls, I mean, they stood up on social media and that was yeah. really impressive to me that they were just willing to put themselves out there and say, hey, there's an issue. Um, and so yeah. just, I think that the more we can do that as women and putting ourselves out there to say, listen, there are, there are issues and there is inequity and we have got to fight together and build communities. Right. Yes. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, you have to, you know, build that group, you know, the tenured faculty group and everything, but it is hard. Um, you know, a lot, of, it's really easy to take shots at the NCAA a lot of those coaches that wrote these amazing things that we posted on our Facebook and on our Instagram page, um, <clears throat> a lot of their the comments that they made, I noticed that their school's really discriminating against women at mm -hmm. their own school. I want to see them to uh, to not just take shots at the NCAA, but their own school. That's harder to do, but it can be done. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody starts off thinking that's what they're going to do, but um, as I said, the NCAA is not doing it. They're not um, gonna make sure that athletes are not being discriminated against. The, all the adults essentially left the room. So the only people that are left to do it are these 18 to 22 year olds. Mm -hmm. And it's sad that that's who has to do it, but that is the reality right now. 
right? Well, and I think they have they have felt empowered. So I hope so. That. I hope so. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I guess kind of with that being said, um, you know, Nancy, I really appreciate you coming on and, and spending time with us and, and getting to know Jennifer and I a little bit more. Um, I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate, you know, just you speaking, you know, very proudly of your story, but also what you're doing right now in this community, um, in the world that we live in, because it's, it's different. Um, and I think that's something that we all should, you know, be educated on and, and keep learning. Um, cause you know, once we get to that point, it, you know, it, it, it could be, you know, good or bad. And so kind of with that being said, um, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Um, and I really appreciate all of this and, um, any, any other things, um, I guess if you want to say your Instagram handle or in your, your organizations and stuff like that before we kind of, you know, leave this. Sure. Uh, Instagram is I champion women kind of where we rock it more is on Facebook. Um, we, um, I kind of haven't figured out Instagram nearly as well. I'm 59. So I think I'm not quite that age group. Um, and, um, and now you're supposed to say like, Oh, no way you're 59. No, I can be like all like mega and it's like, yes, it's true. I am. No, um, uh, no, I, um, let's see. And Twitter is also I champion women. Um, but yeah, yeah, we, um, we, 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 we try really hard in all of our communication to be value added, not just to be about branding or something like that, but we want to every communication to be teaching and to be, um, to, to help the community bring sports, make, make them more sports, make it fair sports and make it safe sports for everyone. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. I know Jennifer does as well. And, you know, thank you so much with that, Nancy. And, um, hopefully down the road, we'll be able to donate and, you know, um, help advocate, you know, what you're doing every single day. Um, yeah. and with that, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.